Welcome. It is really exciting to have everybody here for this first ever, I think, symposium on sort of patent, patient partnered research. Um, we have an amazing program today. I first want to thank the sponsoring organizations in addition to the Broad. This is sponsored by the Emerson Collective and by the Biden Cancer Initiative, which is uh, still in the air from Washington because of a problem with an engine or something getting out of, out of DC airport. But Greg Simon uh, and Danielle Carnival are en route um, and we'll make it at some point during this program. Uh, but the Biden Cancer Initiative, this newly uh, stood up Cancer Initiative by the former Vice President is a co-sponsor, the Emerson Collective is a co-sponsor, and the Broad is, and we've been working on this for several months, and we are thrilled to have an amazing lineup of speakers, who will go there in just a moment. But I first want to explain what this is about, why we're doing this. An awful lot of biomedical research can take place at the laboratory bench. It can take place in a test tube, can take place in a mouse, and that's led to a lot of deeply fundamental biological discoveries over the last 50 years about molecular biology and the basis of disease and development of certain types of drugs. But if we're really gonna take on disease in a serious way, we have to learn from patient experience. We have to turn our healthcare system into a learning system. Now, people sometimes think about turning the healthcare system into a learning system as just coming along and sucking out big data from electronic medical records so you can learn things about the natural history of the disease or treatment response or, or, or things like that. No, learning from the healthcare system, learning from patient experiences, is a partnership with patients. Patients need to drive this. Patients are the people who own the experience, they own the data, they know more about the disease than anybody else because it's most salient and most important. So it became clear that as we want to move from fundamental facts about this is an oncogene and this is what it triggers as a pathway to what is the natural history of different kinds of cancers? How do people respond as a function of many different factors? We would have to do it by partnering together with patients. That is a very radical idea. It's easy to say, but I think it's fair to say that for the better part of the past century, we viewed patients as research subjects more than research partners. Now, patients themselves have stood up over the past decade or so and made clear that they don't view themselves simply as research subjects because we've seen disease organizations, patient advocacy organizations stand up and play increasingly important roles in guiding the development of therapy. Of course, this isn't a fully new thing. AIDS patients did this decades ago and taught us a lot about the power of patient engagement to focus on important things and drive changes in science and regulation. But we're seeing it now in a much broader way. And with the sets of tools we have available to truly learn, I think we're gonna get so much more out of it. So there's of course patient researcher partnerships. But the most amazing thing is when the patient and the researcher are the same person. And we're seeing that. We're seeing increasingly patients becoming researchers, driving the creation of research projects. In some cases, going and getting PhDs to be able to work on particular topics. And that too is a remarkable thing. So at the Broad, we've been very, very interested in helping to develop this new direction. We've launched a Count Me In initiative to help launch and learn 
from patient partnered research projects. It's launched a couple of projects so far. It'll launch some more. Um, and uh, we know that many other groups are learning about this as well. And we thought it was time to bring together people who had diverse expertise from many different kinds of projects to come together and see if we could, as a community, discuss the experiences and maybe even think together about what was needed to advance them, understand the best practices, the principles, understand what was needed to provide support for it. So that's the goal of this panel, um, is to have a discussion about this. And I hope it will kick off a great deal of additional conversation in the, in the coming months. Uh, and I'm going to turn over um, you know, well, to, to our moderator for the panel, who is not Greg Simon, the director of the Biden Cancer Initiative, who I've mentioned is still somewhere between here and Washington, uh, landing soon, I trust. Um, but instead to Tanya Simoncelli. Um, Tanya is the executive director of the uh, uh, Count Me Initiative here at the Broad. She's senior advisor to the director, that's me. Um, and she has a remarkable history before that. Um, she is kind of, well, completely single-handedly responsible for having launched the gene patenting case about the breast cancer gene. The case was carried forward by, by a number of people at the ACLU, but it was entirely Tanya's conception and Tanya whipped it into shape uh, and, and got it ready to become what was a landmark decision at the Supreme Court. She has worked at the FDA as a special advisor to the commissioner, and she has also worked at the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy on a number of biological initiatives, including having been one of the architects of the Precision Medicine Initiative. And so, with that introduction, I turn over to Tanya Simoncelli, who will introduce our panelists and moderate. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming. It's, it's really wonderful to see everybody here. This has been a really wonderful process to develop this, this event. Um, I am really quite humbled to be sharing the stage with this remarkable uh, group of individuals. Um, and you're really in, in for a treat in the sense of uh, just to hear, have a chance to hear their extraordinary stories and their journeys um, as patients, as patient organizers, as patient scientists. Um, one of the reasons that this particular group of people is on this stage, um, and one of the things I think you'll hear that's common throughout their stories, is that um, in each of these cases, uh, these individuals took their experiences uh, with disease and um, actually took that experience, and that experience actually prompted them to make really dramatic changes in their lives. And I think in every situation, actually, to take on entirely new professions and develop entirely new expertise, and some, in many of these cases, becoming actually patient scientists, people who had no scientific training uh, before, before, having, uh, bef before being faced with um, illness or the prospect of illness. So, um, you know, this is a group of, like, as I said, patient scientists, patient organizers, and others um, who've channeled their learnings and have dedicated now their lives to channeling those learnings from their own experiences as, as patients into efforts to change the health system and to advance progress against their disease. So to introduce each of them, I don't want to tell you anything about their actual stories, so I'm going to give very brief introductions. Um, I'll introduce each of them one at a time. Um, they'll each, they can go up to the podium if you choose to, or sit here and tell your story, and then we'll have lots of time. Uh, uh, they'll each talk for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have lots of time for uh, Q&A from the audience, as well as discussion across the panel. So to begin, um, first up will be Josh Summer, who's the executive director and was actually the founder uh, from back in 2007 of the Cordoma Foundation. Josh? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's a, a real pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. 
and especially to be in, in such good company with uh, peers who have really blazed parallel paths. It's not often that we get to um, meet one another and, and compare notes. So this is a, something I've been looking forward to for a while. Um, Tanya, you said something interesting that uh, you know, none of us really chose to go down the paths that we've gone down, that we were kind of each had different backgrounds and uh, were confronted with a, an illness that uh, was really life-changing. Um, in my case, I was um, diagnosed uh, with this rare type of cancer called chordoma when I was an undergrad um, back in 2006. And so really, at that point, was kind of a blank canvas. Um, and now over the last decade or so, um, this has kind of turned into somewhat of a life's mission and has turned into a, a career. Um, and I guess I would just argue at the outset that the career that all of us have now is, is one for which there's really no training. There's no, there's no course that you can go to to become a patient driver of research. There's no major or doctorate. Um, and yet, I think what has become incredibly clear is that the role that patient advocates, that patient research drivers play is really, really critical for the research ecosystem. Um, I guess the way I've come to think of it is that you know, there are certain plays that the, the kind of typical actors within research can make. If you think of it as a, as a sports field, if, if you will, there are certain plays that, that drug companies can make with, with invest academic researchers and with physicians. But when patients are on the field, there's a whole different set of plays that can be made. And I think what we're seeing is that remarkable things can happen. Um, and so I guess with that is maybe a, a preamble um, can just kind of trace the, the, a brief history of the Cordoma Foundation and kind of share how I went from being this undergrad at Duke and somewhat of a blank canvas now into um, you know, someone who's, who's been dedicated to uh, driving forward research in this disease. Um, so as I said, about uh, you know, almost a dozen years ago now was, was diagnosed with this, um, this very rare form of cancer. And I, and I, I don't want to try to convince you that Cordoma is uh, any um, more of a difficult or challenging disease than any other. I mean, the reality is any life-threatening disease is, um, it is a huge upheaval in one's life and it is a huge challenge that needs to be solved. Um, in my case, uh, my tumor was located in the very center of my head. So if you could imagine drawing a line from ear to ear and back from your nose, right where those two lines would intersect in the, in the very center of, of, of my skull. Um, and going into surgery, I didn't know what the disease was other than it had to be removed. And, and there was kind of a, a short list of things that it could have been, Cordoma being what we were hoping that it would not be. Um, but after kind of having a successful surgery and, and uh, getting this diagnosis, it was, um, you know, it, was, it, was, it was an incredible shock. Uh, being 18 years old at the time and just having so much to look forward to, um, I, I really didn't want to accept what I learned about the disease, that there was an average survival of just seven years, um, that beyond surgery and in some cases radiation, there were really no effective therapies, there was a high rate of recurrence. Um, and unfortunately, if the tumor came back after, after surgery, that there really was no effective therapy or a cure. Um, and so I became determined to try to do anything in my power to change those odds. And with my mother, who was a physician at the time, we scoured the country to try to find labs that were working on Cordoma. Uh, at the time, there were just a handful. It turned out that the only NIH-funded Cordoma researcher in the entire country, by complete serendipity, um, happened to be an investigator at Duke, of all places where I was an undergrad. And so after I recovered from surgery, I uh, show up in this researcher's lab. His name is Dr. Mike Kelly. I show up in his lab. Uh, completely green, not knowing the first thing about cancer research or molecular biology, um, and, and seek to try to understand what he was doing, what the challenges were that he was facing, what, if anything, that I and my mother could, could do to try to drive research forward and, and to support him. And uh, what became clear was that there were a number of challenges that were standing in the way of the work that he was doing, and, um, but, but one of them was that he simply needed someone, an extra pair of hands in the lab. And so um, I again, not knowing the first thing about, about cancer research, kind of volunteered uh, to, to kind of be a lab tech and a lab hand. Um, and you know, coming from an engineering background, uh, I, I, I think um, at kind of 
inappropriately thought of uh, kind of cancer research as being this nebulous, ill-defined field in relation to engineering. But I guess what I quickly learned was that there was incredibly inspiring work being done. There was an incredible progress in understanding the kind of basic biology of cancer and driving progress forward in other diseases. Um, but getting into the lab and uh, digging into the projects that we were working on there, it, I, I kind of saw firsthand the challenges that researchers studying rare cancers face. Um, we didn't have access to tumor tissue that was so vital for the research we, we wanted to do. We didn't have access to cell lines or animal models. Uh, we were working essentially in complete isolation. Um, on top of that, it turns out that when we scoured the globe and tried to find Cordoma cell lines, and we were able to get a number of them sent to the lab at Duke, they all started behave, they all you know, looked a little bit different under the microscope, they behaved a little bit differently, and much to my surprise, it turns out that only one of the six Cordoma cell lines that we identified in the literature turned out to actually be valid Cordoma. Um, you, some of you in the audience may have read uh, Rebecca Sklut's book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which just turned into a, a movie on HBO. And you know, the, the story that is, is shared in, in that book about uh, the, the problem of misidentification and contamination of cell lines, it incredibly repeats over and over and over again. Um, this was incredibly eye-opening, and it, it kind of made me, and, um, ma made me realize that there were some problems that the, the kind of research enterprise was not solving on its own, um, that there were, that there were uh, challenges that uh, that were standing in the way of research that the field was not, uh, was not taking on, was not adequately addressing, and that to really have a chance of, of curing this disease was going to require a way to solve those problems, a way to overcome the scarcity of, of tissue and cell lines, animal models, to bring together a research community um, and to provide, uh, to provide funding to enable many more labs and researchers to bring their expertise to bear on this disease. Um, and so, uh, basically, that led my mother and I to, to start the Cordoma Foundation in 2007 to be that coordinating body, to, uh, to bring the research field together, uh, to create a basic infrastructure to enable research to uh, move forward effectively, um, to connect researchers with one another, and then, of course, to provide funding to, to make the research go. So kind of transitioned out of the lab, and, and since 2008 have now uh, full-time been, been running the Cordoma Foundation. Um, really, the first thing that we, we, we set out to do was to build a field of Cordoma researchers. So we, we've hosted now uh, five international Cordoma research workshops where we brought together essentially everyone who had studied or published on Cordoma in the past, as well as uh, researchers who were studying uh, other types of cancer or uh, who had particular uh, interests that were aligned with Cordoma. And through bringing together this community of researchers, have been able to identify uh, a clear set of priorities and develop a research roadmap um, that has really guided the work of the foundation uh, over the past decade. Um, so just to kind of fast forward now, over that time, we've, uh, we've gone from having just a handful of researchers in the field to now having 200 researchers um, studying Cordoma. Uh, we've built the basic infrastructure to fuel their research. We've created a biobank to collect, store, and distribute tumor tissue. We've uh, spurred the development now of over 20 Cordoma cell lines and created a centralized cell line resource that, um, has, that has provided cell lines to over 100 labs across the world. Uh, we've developed uh, PDX models. Um, most recently, we've developed a drug screening pipeline to uh, dramatically reduce the time and cost of generating uh, preclinical proof of concept data to support uh, and, and justify clinical trials. And I think what's become really clear is that the role that an organization driven by patients can play is really far more than just providing funding. So if, if you think about historically the role that patients played, of course, as research subjects, as, as Eric mentioned, but, but also we've, you know, for you know, several you know, decades now, there, there have been great examples of researchers playing an important role in funding, an important role in encouraging and stimulating research. But I would argue that there's, there are other really important levers that patients have by creating an infrastructure, a research infrastructure and tools and resources 
um, that are as powerful, if not more powerful, than funding. So the, the research dollars that we've been able to leverage, the work that we've been able to get done by providing cell lines and animal models far outstrips what we've been able to get done by providing funding to 27 labs. Um, and I think there's, it, it's, it's wonderful being here at the Broad because arguably one of the, the best examples of, of a, a deep partnership that we've developed is with uh, a group here at the Broad led by Stuart Schreiber and uh, Tanaz Sharifnia who's in the audience. Um, and, and because we've been able to bring to bear tumor tissue, cell lines, animal models, patient involvement, that's been matched with the incredible expertise and platform technologies that exist here at the Broad. Small molecule screens, genome-wide CRISPR loss of function screens, super enhancer analysis. Um, and so there's been this kind of incredibly deep and productive partnership that over the last three years has really revealed a lot about the fundamental biology of Cordoma, identified key vulnerabilities, and has now zeroed in on what seems to be uh, the prime vulnerability and, and probably the most important target uh, in Cordoma. It's a transcription factor called brachyuri. Um, and so if you can imagine you know, several dozen of these partnerships with researchers across the world happening in parallel, bubbling up you know, new insights about the biology of the disease, identifying new therapeutic targets. We've now uh, identified over 30 therapeutic targets. Many of those are already druggable, and, um, and has, that has led to a, a growing pipeline of therapies moving towards clinical trials. There are seven clinical trials that we're, um, that we're su uh, supporting now. Um, but I think the, kind of the next frontier is, is this new target that's been identified, uh, brachyuria. It, it remains an undruggable target. And um, now a big focus of ours is really uh, a full court press to try to bring together uh, a, a group of researchers, drug companies, um, to, to kind of attack brachyuri from uh, multiple different angles, and the Broad is certainly playing a, a big role in that. Um, the final thing that I'll mention is that as we now kind of, as the research emerges from the lab and moves into the clinic, what we recognize is one of the biggest rate limiting factors that's standing in the way of research is, is um, patient participation in clinical trials. This is probably not a surprise to many people in the room because um, it's, a, it's a challenge that many diseases, certainly many rare cancers face. And so we recognized uh, about three or four years ago that um, seeing this, kind of this, this uh, challenge emerging, that, that bring, being able to connect patients with clinical trials would be of utmost importance. So we've actually pivoted the work of the foundation a little bit, and um, in parallel to our research efforts, we've built out an entire suite of, of services for the patient community, recognizing that if you start to try to build relationships with patients at the time when you're trying to recruit for your clinical trial, that's really far too late. Um, that there really needs to be a, um, you know, a deep relationship that's built over time. Hopefully, the patients that we're supporting never need to participate in a clinical trial. But if they do, we want to be there as a trusted partner throughout their journey with the disease so that if and when they need a trial, we have a trusting relationship established and we're able to connect patients to the trials that, um, that may exist for them. And I'll just say that um, the very first trial that we uh, tried to uh, kind of broadcast to the patient community, we, we didn't quite know how, it would, how well it would work, but um, there were, it, was a, it was an expansion. It was an expansion of a phase one trial. There were 10 slots for Cordoma. And uh, within the span of a week, there were 30 patients uh, who had reached out and, and were on a waiting list for this trial. So I think that it's just a, a case in point at how, how investing in serving a patient community, engaging a patient community, is really not separate from research. I, I view it, I've come to view it as part and parcel to research um, and really being inextricably linked uh, with the research process. So, um, they, you know, serving patients um, is, is, I think, can be viewed um, as uh, just as important a research tool as providing grants or providing preclinical models or any other lever that we can use to advance research. And I think maybe we'll explore that topic more uh, over the course of this meeting. But um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and look forward to engaging conversation. Thanks, Josh. That was terrific. Um, next, we have Brad Margus. I promised I wouldn't give away his story, but I believe he's going to talk 
a bit about how he went from being a food industry CEO hey, don't to <laughs> don't say anything. to doing lots of other things, and I won't tell you anymore. But that that are uh, have to do with health right, and disease. So, so uh, I'm going to stay in the ten minutes, but I'm going to have to go really, really fast. But I know a lot of friends at the road are fast clock people, so I'm counting on you to keep up. Um, and uh, here we go. So. My life story. So I went to Harvard Business School many years ago. When I was there, I was in my 20s. Eric Lander was like a six-year-old math prodigy who was a professor there at the same time. <laughs> Let's go figure. Um, all my classmates went to either consulting or investment banking. And I did something bizarre. I did a leverage buyout of a shrimp processing company. Ended up with um, factories in Thailand, Ecuador, and Florida. Um, many of you, I know some of you know this story, and I'm really sorry. Please don't look at me like you're getting nauseous, but I, I, I only have one story, so you got to hear the story again. Um, so I was a shrimp guy, and I know what you're all thinking, um, so you can go ahead and say it, that everybody always thinks of Forrest Gump right away, and that's what I was. Um, um, shrimp was very good to me, and, uh, and uh, hopefully some of you think my IQ is a little higher. So, so life was good, and actually... Shrimp business, I paid down the debt and actually did very well as a career. Um, and then in the mid-90s, um, my wife at that time and uh, I had three sons in about three and a half years. And then, like so many families we now know, um, we then got a diagnosis. And in our case, um, Jared in the middle and Quinn on the right were diagnosed with this tough disease called ataxia telangiectasia. And we quickly learned that it's really, really rare, about 400 kids in the whole United States and uh, obscure and what people refer to as orphan or ultra-orphan disease. Um, it affects a lot of different systems of the body. The, the protein that's missing is really critical. And in this case, 100% of kids have um, serious neurological problems because their cerebellum in the back bottom right of their brain is uh, deteriorating. The kid on the left is 12 years old and healthy. The kid on the right has AT. And so the kids run around when they're two and seem pretty fine. And then by Nine or ten are usually in wheelchairs, motorized wheelchairs, and then other things that involve muscle control, like eye tracking makes it difficult to read, and swallowing becomes difficult. A lot of kids have uh, GI tubes. Um, slurred speech gets really frustrating, not only making it difficult to function, but also socially. Um, so um, um, AT kids have it really rough, but on top of the neurological stuff, then um, most of the kids have immune problems. Um, about 35% of the kids get cancer. And uh, usually lymphomas or leukemias before 20 and then solid tumors after that. And uh, there's a premature aging facet to it, shortened telomeres. Um, and then if they don't die from cancer, um, usually lung problems are the biggest problem. So my response, like everybody here has this response, was to try to learn the science. I had a couple of PhDs tutor me very deeply but very, very narrowly on only the science I cared about for the disease. Initially that was finding the gene, positional cloning, linkage studies, you know, old school, a long time ago. Um, but uh, as soon as we had the gene, I didn't care about genetics and moved on to knock out animals or whatever. Um, learning how the science works was even harder. Um, I, I didn't know anything about how biomedical research is funded in the United States or what makes you good or bad or so on. Um, learning who the scientists were, who the good scientists were, you really couldn't ask them if they were good. You had to find out another way. <laughs> um, learning how they're motivated, turns out they're not all motivated the same. Some need money, glory, some really want to solve a puzzle. Some, kid, some response to pictures of your kids. Um, and uh, the worst part of all was I was a business person. I never saw myself as a fundraising type and, and you know, selling magazines in high school or whatever. I stunk. I'm not the kind to ask for donations. I'm not the god of fundraising like Eric Lander. And so, um, <laughs> you know, collecting for UNICEF or whatever, I stunk. And so I now had to learn how to do fundraising too. So since you're going to get my journey, you're going to not just get articulate science like Josh was able to talk about, but you're all going to hear about all the other stuff we had to do. So we formed a nonprofit organization called the AT Children's Project. Um, again, it was a really hard marketing challenge to try to market a disease. I mean, we should have thought of Count Me In. That would have been a great name for us. But <laughs> we ate taxi at Tonic Tasia, oh, brother. Nevertheless, we did a bunch of fundraising. This is like a handful of now hundreds and hundreds of different types of events we could tell you we had. They were all grassroots. To date, we haven't found any millionaires or billionaires with, with an AT kid, and even though it's really, really immoral and horrible to say this, I still fantasize about it. <laughs> We've had uh, all different kinds of mar walkathons and marathons, and, and a couple of princesses running for us, and we had this guy in, uh, named Tim Borland who ran 
63 whole marathons, 26 miles, in 63 consecutive days across the country um, to raise awareness for us. And at each stop along the way, they, they, uh, we had fundraising events for them. Um, the guy did really well. We had a guy who was a four-time Olympian for the triathlon that um, did a lot for helping us with awareness and got on a Wheaties box and let us mention it. Um, I'm just throwing up funny examples. A family in, with AT kids in Atlanta, Georgia, had a motocross thing they were involved in, so they had a fundraiser there. And it's one of like a million examples of things I got involved in that I knew nothing about, like really motocross. And the next week it was like a horse show where you had to know all about horses. You know, um, a guy in France sailed across the Atlantic in a race solo um, to raise awareness for our foundation. I just threw this slide in because I like to show cookies with our logo on it. Um, we've had all kinds of events. Some of them are serious. Some of them are pretty funny. Doughboy Dash in Rhode Island is funny. And even though we're really, really tiny and and you really can't rely on only families who have kids with disease to raise money. We really have to reach out to strangers to help us. We still have tried to scale up and, and do things beyond being like a kitchen table organization. And, and we have now fundraising workshops where we help other families uh, um, learn from each other and, and run better fundraisers. Um, we've increased awareness over the years. It's really hard to keep it going, but every once in a while we get in uh, TV or media. Um, that's a crazy example. There's a couple of AT kids run on Walmart trucks for a while. Um, the two on the left actually visited the Broad recently. Um, we've had some celebrities involved. Uh, celebrities sometimes help you, sometimes they really don't, believe it or not. And the real reason I have this slide up there is just to show you uh, Jennifer Garner hugging me. <laughs> um, Grammy Award winning country singer Brad Paisley actually recorded a song that was written by an AT kid on the right, Joe Kindergren. Very moving song when we got the proceeds from uh, iTunes. Um, Joe did pass away last year. And uh, so how, what did we do with the cash? We, uh, we awarded a lot of research grants. We still do. This is a lab that found the gene. We've collected lots of samples, blood samples, skin samples, all those other kinds of samples. Um, the latest thing is, the latest trend, of course, is every single researcher submits a grant. 99% of the time, it's, we want to make iPS cells from your kids. You know, it's like this year's thing. And, uh, we have a lot of other tools, like make antibodies that are specific in mice or humans for localizing the protein. Um, lots of model organisms have been pretty useful for some things, but unfortunately, the higher animals have not recapitulated the neurological problems. Really disappointing for us, um, even many pigs that we made recently. Now, to be clear, the people who make the models always insist that they have a wonderful disease phenotype neurologically, but nobody else can see it. Um, our current attempt is to try to do it in marmosets because they're a primate. Maybe they'll be more like kids. Um, we're using uh, CRISPR and, and, and uh, trying to knock them out. Um, other tools, we've worked with some companies to make inhibitors. We've run lots of small focus workshops on whatever topic we want to dive into. Um, our last one was on mitochondria dysfunction. We've had big meetings that have abstract books and all that. If you emphasize the cancer aspect of ATM protein, we can get thousands of people to come um, it's harder on narrower subjects. We've tried to share data sets uh, um, with researchers and make them accessible. Um, we've developed clinical sales for measuring the disease that would quantitatively measure longitudinally what happens to kids over time and, and additively come up with a, some kind of scale you could use to test the treatment. Um, like every disease, we've been searching for biomarkers. Um, I'm not real a, a big fan of proteomics from all the grants we've had that have come up empty. Uh, we step, the disease is like, with any rare disease, most of the time, if a physician sees a kid with it, it's the only case he's going to see in his or her career. So we ended up setting up a clinical center at Johns Hopkins that has a multidisciplinary team there that has now seen a lot of kids. Uh, for the cancer aspect, we set up a clinic at, at St. Jude that uh, optimizes or tweaks the protocols for cancer. So because the ET kids have special problems like hypersensitivity, radiation, things like that. Um, the lung problems, other clinical studies we've done. Um, <coughs> brain imaging. Um, we do a lot on educating the families. Um, we've interacted with industry a lot and academics, and that's my son, Jarrett, meaning um, Eric Lander, I think it is. <laughs> and and uh, we interact with a lot of families, building a community, again, with only 400 families in the country at any one time. I mean, there's a lot of turnover, but we, we really make an effort to build a cohesive group. It's really hard, you know. One little dirty secret is even though you bring yourselves all together, you really don't have a lot in common with each other except this disease, and you don't want it to be a meeting to commiserate over your problem. So we really work hard to change that. Um, newborn screening has been expanding in different states, and we've been able to pick up more kids earlier just by 
the uh, immune deficiency screens that are being done. I'm going to give you a two-minute tour of our research. So basically four paths. The first is to somehow restore the protein or by either fixing the gene, like gene therapy or gene editing, or maybe uh, correcting it somehow and autologously putting them back in again, um, or read-through compounds that skip exons that are mutated. Um, another way is to somehow save those brain cells with, uh, with either anti-inflammatories for the inflammation strategy or, or with uh, growth factors that aren't specific to the disease. Um, we've got a lot of defects in the cells, like mitochondria dysfunction, that there are different companies that are now working on strategies for. And then just to give you a really demoralizing picture for those of us who are patient advocates and a really intriguing picture for those of you who are scientists, the gene was cloned in 95, and this is what we knew about the protein biology. Um, by 2010, this is the map of what we knew about the biology and all the substrates of the ATM protein that include some famous ones like P53 and BRCA1. By 2017, there's no way I can get them on the slide, but um, for a researcher, this is probably really intriguing stuff, and if you're the guy who cloned the gene, this is great news. You're getting cited all the time, but if you're me, you're really bummed. You wanted to just have one downstream protein that's hyperactive because of the mutation, and we just have to inhibit it, or maybe augment it, if it needs augmented with a milkshake full of it, and we didn't find that. Um, we still don't know why AT cell brain cells really die in the kids, and specifically, the proteins everywhere, why is that one cell type in particular die? Um, we've now f uh, switched away from a lot of biology and also looked at um, perhaps, as in Parkinson's disease, if you have those cells dying, maybe even though they're mostly gone, you could still fix the circuitry or correct the circuitry by doing deep brain stimulation, either electrically or, or pharmacologically. Um, so what have we done with all this? I still don't have a treatment, I still don't have a cure. We've been able to manage disease better. So when my kids were diagnosed, the median age of death was about 16, 16 and a half. Now it's about 24, so that's about a 50% increase in how long the kids can live on average. Um, but uh, life still sucks. They still are in wheelchairs at 9 and 10. Quality of life really stinks. Um, we continue to think out of the box. No offense to biologists and chemists, but we're now also talking to engineers, because sometimes engineers are good at solving certain kinds of problems. And um, I know this company, Lyft, that Googlebot, that makes a tremor uh, smoothing spoon or fork. We're playing with those. Um, everyone's seen these exoskeletons to help paraplegics and stuff walk, but we don't really need the strength part. So I'm talking to some engineers about combining that with, um, with gyroscopes to somehow stabilize in the early stage of the disease. So back to my personal story real quick. I, uh, in the late 90s, I not only worked in the AT Children's Park, but also got involved kind of advocating for a lot of other diseases, genetic diseases on Capitol Hill. Um, and uh, in 2000, I had a chance to get out of my shrimp company and uh, move into biotech and start a biotech genomics company called Perligen in California, Silicon Valley. In 2009, I switched and, and uh, uh, got, I loved going into science because all the part you heard about up to now, I was doing as a night job um, as a volunteer, but in the daytime, I still had to have phone calls with the president of TGI Fridays about a new shrimp item right on their menu. <laughs> so, so when I switched to being CEO of Perligen, I mean, it's always nice to move to a new industry as CEO. That's what I was, I was lucky. But, <laughs> but to have MDs and PhDs working for me who could explain stuff, to be able to go to dinner with pharmaceutical companies was, was uh, really satisfying. You'd think it's about science, at least. But it was still only genomics. Um, Envoy was uh, actually focusing on CNS drug discovery. We made some really good progress for schizophrenia drugs and Parkinson's drugs. That company I sold to, ph to Cato Pharmaceuticals in 2012. And uh, a few months ago, I started Cerevance with $40 million, and again, I'm focused on CNS diseases. So I'm really getting at least my career to focus on the same area as my kids' rare disease, even though my investors aren't real supportive of working on a really rare disease. Um, and to be clear, I still think about my, my kids' disease when I wake up in the morning or when I go to sleep at night. And uh, unlike Josh, who was really magnanimous and said we all deserve to have our disease worked on and all that, if I had it my way, everybody at the Broad and anybody else, anybody at other institutions here, would all be working on AT and would forget everything else. <laughs> um, so just really quickly, what I can share about patient research, I want to point out that there are a few people that are going to speak at other panels, like Jennifer, who's from the AT Children's Project here, who actually have done it. And a lot of stuff that those of us who were strategizing thought would be difficult turned out to be easy, and some things that were easy are actually not so easy. Those are the people we really want to listen to later. But along those lines, I just want to introduce the subject of shareable database. Um, you know, we really needed to find all the patients we can around the world because it's so rare. We also have this data that we generated over time 
on the variability we see between different AT kids, especially ones that are not siblings versus siblings. And so we really have come to think that there may be modifying genes or other loci around the genome that, that account for that variability and can make you more severe or more mild. We'd love to discover that by studying, but you need enough patients to do it. Um, we also know that there are new types of data, whether it's genomics, you know, sequence data or microbiome or um, data uploaded from a wearable device about movement that we'd like to capture in a big way. And the other thing was the old school way of talking to registries and all. We found that they were always thinking in terms much more narrowly as one study at a time or a consortium of researchers that owned it. And we, we didn't want it to be that way. So um, you can get me to rant on that with a glass of wine for about two hours. Um, we wanted to share with everyone. So we started this thing called the Global AT Family Data Platform. We did not want to do it ourselves. We wanted to, we talked to a lot of companies and nonprofits that had different turnkey solutions, supposedly. They always had a catch about ownership of the data. There was always something. Maybe they, it was completely free. They make it all free, and you could share it with anybody you wanted to. And then I'd say, what about, can I share it with Pfizer? And they'd go, oh, oh no. Then we need to charge a subscription. There was always something there. So we ended up uh, really thinking about ourselves and then talking to some people here at the Broad, and, and, and uh, we've made it happen. So. That's the end of my story. This is the other, uh, my other son with AT, and, and as you can see, he attracts girls. <laughs> but I didn't say like my dad, like his dad. I didn't say that. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Um, next up is Janet Freeman Daly. Um, after applying her MIT and Caltech engineering degrees, speaking of engineering. Um, to a career in aerospace systems engineering and new business for two decades. Janet uh, now is working uh, primarily as a patient act activist who uses her communications and science background to translate the experience of lung cancer treatment and research for others. So, Janet. Thank you. I can drop a whole paragraph out of my story. <laughs> So oh, thanks to the Broad Institute for putting this conference together. I'm really excited to see where it's going to take us. I was um, working as a writer, actually, after I'd retired from engineering. But I'd had this light cough, kind of a <clears throat> And after a while, my husband said, why don't you go to the doctor? So we checked it out, thought it was, took antibiotics. Well, didn't do any good. Tried some more antibiotics, didn't do any good. Let's take a chest x-ray. Oh, look at that. I had advanced lung cancer, out of the blue. So I had chemotherapy and radiation together and progressed. And I had more chemo and more radiation and progressed again. My doctor said I'd be on chemo for the rest of my life. But I had been active in the online patient community and happened to connect with patients who told me about genomic testing. And they also said it was very likely that since I was negative for a couple of the uh, genomic mutations that are tested for, EGFR and ALK. I was young, relatively healthy, adenocarcinoma. There was a good chance I had a different genomic alteration called ROS1 fusion. I arranged to have my tissue tested, and I tested positive, and I arranged to get myself into a clinical trial with my doctor's assistance. And I've been on crizotinib, which is an oral medication, since November 2012, and I have had no evidence of disease for four and a half years and counting. Wow. So although lung cancer is not the most commonly diagnosed cancer, it is the biggest cancer killer. It kills twice as many women as breast cancer. It kills more men than prostate. Most people don't know that. However, among that, and within lung cancer, ROS1 is in 1 to 2 percent of the non-small cell patients, so maybe 1 percent of all lung cancers. It's relatively rare. And even though the uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines now say all lung cancer patients with adenal that for non-small cell lung cancer should be tested for ROS1. Uh, recent papers say that maybe 60 percent of people are getting molecular testing and they're not always doing ROS1. So we have only one drug that's approved right now, crizotinib, and it doesn't cure. It inhibits the cancer, but eventually the cancer is smart, it mutates again, and develops a resistance to the drug. And at the moment, we don't have any other approved options. So about, um, well, in 2015, a group of lung cancer patients went to the Longevity Hope Summit. There were 150 lung cancer patients there, and only five of us 
had Ross won. We all knew each other online. Some of us had even met in person before. And we found ourselves sitting in the bar talking about how are we gonna stay alive? We all had children at home, some of them as young as four. We all had metastatic cancer. We were all on crizotinib, and we all knew we didn't have any other options. We left the conference knowing we should do something, but nobody really knew what. Well, the approach we took was in the next few months, a group of us got together and created a private Facebook group to talk just about ROS1. And yes, there are a lot of patient communities, but ROS1 is such a small percentage that our conversations tended to get lost. There were one or two threads in a couple of patient communities and they weren't very active. So we got people together on Facebook and within a few months we had about uh, 50 patients together, which is pretty unusual considering the crizotinib trial was a total of 50 patients. And we started talking about treatments and dealing with side effects and who are the experts in our disease and what clinical trials are available to us and found that to be incredibly useful. But it wasn't getting us anywhere. So later on, a few of us had gone to the World Conference on Lung Cancer in Denver, and we arranged to meet with Dr. Ross Kamage at University of Colorado, who happens to be my clinical trial oncologist. And we asked him, what can we do to get more research into ROS1? There were like four, research, four researchers in the world. And he said, you need to organize and find some partners. Well, one of the patients, Lisa Goldman, first thing she did was went and talked to Bonnie Giadario, who is, I believe, a 13-year lung cancer survivor, who started the Bonnie Giadario Foundation and is a big believer in patient-driven research. And Bonnie said, we want to help you. So then we decided we were going to try and put a project together. Bonnie said, why don't you give us your goals for research? And we all looked at each other and said, oh, <laughs> patients have no idea what's going on in research. So our first reaction is, well, we all want drugs that are gonna make us better. However, most of the patients, their idea of research is you throw money at a clinical trial and the drug miraculously appears in time to save us. Well, the average lung cancer patient survives, dies with the first year of diagnosis. And those of us on crizotinib were getting years, but we didn't think we had a lot of years more. So then we started thinking longer term, what can we do? Well, I had a science background, and I had a good relationship with Dr. Kamage and also with Dr. Bob Doble at University of Colorado, who was one of those ROS1 researchers. And we started having conversations about what goes into ROS1 research, what, what would make a big impact on our disease. And we started coming up with something of a different plan. So we gave our goals to Bonnie and the Bonnie J. Adario Foundation and their sister foundation, the Adario Lung Cancer Medical Institute, partnered with us to create the Global ROS1 Initiative. We now have over 160 patients in our group in 19 different countries associated with researchers in four different countries, all talking about where can we go with ROS1. The first project that we started was getting all of the patients together to do a survey to try and look at um, epidemiological causes. You know, why did we end up with ROS1 alterations in our tumors? That um, got started. We, we got about 50 patients out of the 100 some that were in the group to finish it. But one, we figured out that a lot of patients don't have a lot of patients for a, a one-hour survey. <laughs> And we also realized that we are a multilingual, multi-country uh, multi group. I think we're, we may be one of the first patient groups that are looking at a genomic alteration across cancer types because uh, ROS1 shows up in nine different types of cancers so far. And Google Translate does a lousy job of research <laughs> surveys. <laughs> so that was lesson number one. And lesson number two was that we really needed to understand the science to make a difference. So we talked with the researchers who were explaining this very clearly to us and realized that what we needed was more models. Right now, there's one um, patient-derived xenograft mouse of ROS1, and there's maybe three viable cell lines. Evidently, it's notoriously difficult to create cell lines for ROS1. And ROS1 fuses with over 20 different genes and is in nine different cancers. So those cell lines are not a good representative of our disease. So we decided to do something about that. 
So now when people in our ROS1 group are going to have a biopsy or a surgery or um, have pleural fluid drawn off, we arrange for them to send their specimen to Dr. Doble at University of Colorado, who works on creating cell lines. And just in the past two months from two donations, we've gotten one cell line and another one's in progress. We're expanding this to create contracts so that we're going to be working with an industry representative and a couple of academicians to make PDX mouses and cell lines, mouses, mice, mices, and try and create more models so that researchers can understand the biology of our disease. Why are we getting ROS1? How is it mutating? What are the resistance, resistance mutations that are coming up? We also are taking advantage of our group. Um, there's, I think, a dozen worldwide clinical trials, or a dozen clinical trials around the world that are looking at ROS1. And we share information about what clinical trials follow and what sequence, which ones deal with which, which resistance mutations. Um, but it's, that's also a challenge because different countries have different rules about what drugs they will approve and what you have to go through. In the US, if a patient gets diagnosed with ROS1 cancer, uh, at least lung cancer at the moment, you can get in crizotinib and in most insurance pays for it. If you have it in a different cancer, you can have um, enter, say, the NCI MATCH trial, which includes ROS1 and gives patients crizotinib, or there's also the TAPER trial through ASCO and uh, one other who I'm forgetting at the moment. But if you're in another company, country, say Germany, patients there have a clinical trial that requires them to first have chemo, then immunotherapy, and then they get crizotinib for ROS1. And we know that immunotherapy does not work well for ROS1. For some reason, we don't get a lot of white cells in our, in our uh, tumors to be able to activate them for immunotherapy. So part of what we're working on now is helping patients get the data they need to help get crizotinib approved in their country. And at the moment, I think it's improved in like three other countries and the European Union can market it, but they haven't decided on how much they're gonna pay. Um, and we also are trying to educate people about what ROS1 is because people aren't getting tested. I mean, if it's in 1% of non-small cell lung cancer, we should have 1,900 new cases in the US every year, more worldwide. And if it's in 3% of melanomas of certain type, you should be getting patients there. We're not seeing those patients. We also have a problem in that lung cancer's average age is 71, and a lot of those people are not online. Most of our networking is done online. So how do we reach those patients that are elsewhere? We also have some other barriers that we're dealing with. And my thumb doesn't scroll fast enough. Um, Oncologists are getting, especially in lung cancer, things are changing so fast that they have trouble keeping up. Uh, we had, I think in the past three years, 13 new drug approvals or for new indications in lung cancer alone. So most of the patients, 80% of our patients are treated in community hospitals or, or clinics. And those doctors are not keeping up on current lung cancer. They might treat all cancers and they might not, um, they might even be a general practitioner. So one of the biggest barriers we're dealing with is fighting the healthcare system, no system notion that a patient should do whatever their doctor prescribes for their cancer, even if that doctor doesn't happen to know anything about your particular genomic driver. So the Ross Wonders, as we call ourselves. <laughs> I thought that up. <laughs> are trying to educate as many people as we can. We've created a website that lists all the drugs that are available for, for uh, ROS1 with links to the clinical trials and the evidence. We have a list of all the clinical trials. We have a list of the experts worldwide that people can talk to, some of whom give remote second opinions. Um, we have links to our research, and we are trying to learn more about our disease. And as we progress, um, we hope that we'll be able to have a model for more of the genomically driven cancers that are across cancer types. Uh, we're a good example of the engaged patients that are the new edge of cancer research, and I think will make a big difference in the way research is conducted.
Thank you, Janet. Um, next up, we have Eric Minical and Sonia Vallab, who are husband and wife team and are graduate students and researchers here at the Broad. And I won't say more to, <laughs> to tell their story. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Sonia. This is Eric, my husband. <laughs> um, some familiar themes here. So five and a half years ago, we received a genetic test report that told us that I had inherited a fatal genetic mutation in the prion protein gene. And we had just been through the process of watching my mom die from what was, at, at the time, a completely mysterious, very rapid neurodegenerative disease. Um, over a time scale of just a few weeks, she went from perfectly healthy to profoundly demented, unable to talk, feed herself, recognize us. From her first symptom to her death was 10 months. And in that time, we had no diagnosis. After she died, we learned from her autopsy report that she had died of a genetic prion disease and that I was at 50-50 risk of having inherited the mutation that had caused it. So, oh, of course, thank you. Um, these, these diseases are universally fatal. They are untreatable, then as now. Um, and receiving this information about my risk, that was the worst day of my life. Having to tell Eric was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Um, but we, nevertheless, we decided right away, and I think it's just who we are, that we wanted to get me tested. We pursued those results, we got the report, and maybe counterintuitively, the day that we learned that I had in fact inherited this fatal mutation was the day things started to get better. So at this time, we had no scientific training. Um, I was a recent law school graduate. Eric was working as a city planner and transportation engineer. Um, but I ended up quitting my job, walking into biology classes at MIT, signing up for biology night classes around town. Within a couple months, I would started a new job as a stem cell technician at Mass General Hospital. And it was at that point, sort of walking into a lab every day, that I knew I wasn't going back to the law. Um, you can conclude from this that my old career was not as fun as shrimp. Um, <laughs> so um, not long after that, Eric changed careers too. And during this time, we were, we were calling researchers, going to conferences, reading papers, reading everything we could find on the internet. After about two years of this, we applied to a PhD program at Harvard. Um, this is the path that brought us to Stuart Schreiber's lab here at the Broad, and that brought us to the Broad as our, as our scientific home. And we've now been here two years. Um, during that time, we've had the enormous privilege of focusing day to day on therapeutics for this disease. Um, and I think we've really encountered a level of support and mentorship and guidance here that we could never have imagined when we were first setting off on this path. Um, so having Having that incredible opportunity, we had to ask, and I mean ask ourselves and ask a lot of other people for advice, what is the most realistic route to a therapeutic for prion disease, and what can we do to bring that about that no one else can or will? And we came to see that the fundamental challenge in prion disease is that, A, it's extremely rapid, so first symptom to death is typically half a year, and B, brain damage is irreversible. So all of the clinical trials that had been done in prion disease to date have been done in symptomatic patients, where the best outcome you could hope for is that that drug proves to uh, keep a person alive in a demented, debilitated state for years instead of just months. And what we want is something different. We want to keep Sonia alive and healthy and prevent or delay uh, the onset of disease in the first place. What we want is prevention. And that perspective uh, may seem obvious to, to you guys, but it was not obvious to many of the doctors and scientists we spoke with. Um, so we were told things like, you can't treat people who are perfectly healthy today, like Sonia, because first do no harm. We were told um, it will be difficult for FDA to approve a preventive drug, because how can you show a benefit in patients who are currently healthy? And we were, we were told many times, you know, if you absolutely need to treat before symptoms, could you please at least use imaging or protein markers or something to find people who are about to get sick and already have the disease process making things go wrong in their brain. Um, but we stuck to our guns that uh, we cannot wait. So we can't wait because 
Uh, Sonia's onset could be 20 years from now or it could be tomorrow. We have no way to predict. And if we wait just a moment too long, then all is lost. Our only chance to prevent this disease is to treat before any symptoms strike. So this is the perspective that, that we have as patients. Um, it's not a perspective that we have seen from any scientists that have been in this field for 35 years, right? The people who've been doing this for their whole careers. So from those goals, what, it, what is our mandate? What do we need to do to make prevention possible in prion disease? Um, we have had the great blessing of a lot of mentorship from Eric Lander and others here at the Broad who've helped us shape the three things that we think uh, we can really add as patient, patient researchers and also as scientists based here at the Broad. Um, first, we need a biomarker. We need a laboratory test that we can do on healthy people to show if a therapeutic is having its intended effect. And we need to be able to do that without relying on symptoms, without waiting for those people to get sick. So in prion disease, we have this very strong genetic proof of concept that if we could reduce levels of prion protein, that should be protective against disease. It should also be safe. And when I say prion protein, we're talking about a normal protein before it ever goes wrong, before it ever causes disease. And this is something that we already know you should be able to measure in anybody, in a healthy person. Um, to start to shore that up and dig more deeply into it, we started collecting cerebrospinal fluid samples from collaborators around the world. Um, we teamed up with the Broad Proteomics platform to start developing a new method for measuring prion protein in these samples. And this work is all ongoing, but I can tell you what we've preliminarily learned so far. Um, number one, we can precisely and reproducibly measure this protein in these fluid samples. Number two, the protein is coming from the brain, which is our tissue of interest, and therefore we're able to measure something relevant. And number three, those levels seem to be stable over time. So this gives us some optimism, thank you, that if we could develop a drug that reduces the level of that protein in the brain, we should be able to show that in cerebrospinal fluid samples. We should be able to show the drug-dependent reduction. So this is, this is what we know from what we have. We actually just launched a clinical study or in the process of launching with collaborators at Mass General to collect more of these samples and from exactly the population that we hope to treat someday, pre-symptomatic genetic prion disease mutation carriers like me. So we look forward to expanding those findings. So the second thing we need to do is engage FDA in a conversation about what prevention looks like in prion disease. And to sort of gather our thoughts concretely on this subject, we sat down with Eric Lander. We've drafted a white paper that charts out what the case for prevention looks like, what a biomarker-based trial might look like, but importantly, highlights the areas where we really need FDA's expertise and guidance as we think about how do we make this kind of trial, which really isn't business as usual, convincing, and how do we make it feasible? We just submitted a request for a critical path innovation meeting, and we're hopeful that that will be our sort of first point of contact in an ongoing conversation about how to do this right. And finally, we need to both organize the patient community and sort of fundamentally reorient the scientific community around this idea of prevention. Because even if we had this drug in hand today that can lower prion protein levels, it's not clear how we could best go about recruiting these patients. This is a rare disease. And it's also not clear how many of them we could get, which is going to be a really important piece of data for bringing partners along with us. So along with the Broad Data Donation Platform, we are in the process of building out a registry. Um, hopeful that we'll launch this summer. We just got IRB approval two weeks ago. Um, so, so things are moving along. These are all very much works in progress. This is where we've been able to get in five and a half years, and I think we're still a few years, maybe five years out from aspirationally putting a promising drug into clinical trials in people. 
but we just have to work towards that as fast as we can and hope that it's fast enough. So, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, next up is Bryce Olson, uh, who's the Global Marketing Director and, uh, for Health and Life Sciences at Intel and a cancer survivor. Let, let me just start off by saying I'm such an underachiever compared to everybody <laughs> here. Um, I think I'm going to stand up because I was at a panel recently where uh, they described sitting as the new smoking, and I'm getting a little <laughs> sleepy. Um, so. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't be alive today, honestly, if, uh, if I wouldn't have participated in research. Uh, participating in research got me onto the path to precision medicine and keeps me on that path. And I love that path. I don't want to get off the path because imprecision medicine sucks. <laughs> I've, it, I've been on that rodeo. I know what the experience is of one size fits all treatment plans where everybody gets treated the same way, where the approach to cancer care is very paternalistic. Uh, it's very one-sided. Uh, I felt when I went through it, because I went through it all, and pretty much all, and I, I felt like a zombie kind of going through it. And I, that's not what I wanted to feel like. I wanted to feel engaged, and I wanted to feel that I was on an expedition exploring together with my research partner. Uh, and, I, and I just didn't feel that way. Um, so just a short little bit about me. So I got diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, very aggressive prostate cancer in March of 2014. And uh, I, it was interesting. I remember the, the direct hit that I got on the phone call. It was, it was my oncologist on the other end and it was the first blow and he's, he had this really monotonous voice. He was kind of like, I don't want me to tell you, but you have aggressive prostate cancer. You need to take action on it. It could be life-threatening. <laughs> so I, I proceed to go to scans to get imaging the next day. And, and I'm hoping for the best, but I'm planning for the worst. I'm expecting to be lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, and uh, because the, the cancer I got on, for folks that know about prostate cancer, uh, you know, I had all 12 cores positive, about 90% of the whole thing was consumed with cancer, it was spilling into my seminal vesicles, but on that Tuesday, so Monday I get the call from, you know, Dr. Monotony, and uh, Tuesday I go in for my, my scans, and it turns out I got lucky, you know, because Wednesday I get the results, and it was a little bit of a break from the midweek beatdown, and they told me that my scans were negative, and so, matter of fact, we might be able to resect this thing and take it out and... and maybe get a cure out of it. So I was really stoked. And I went in for surgery in April and uh, you know, recovered. Six weeks later, I went into my post-op and there were four doctors waiting for me. Um, by the way, that's never a good sign if, if, you're, if you're wondering. And they, they said, you know, we're here because we've never seen anybody with a marker as high as yours post-op or somebody who should have had a successful surgery. And so, you know, just in this 10 week period of Diagnosis and scans, four weeks later surgery, six weeks later post-op, I go from nothing on scans to having three lesions the size of quarters on my, on my hip bones and pelvic area. So it was explosive growth. Um, so, you know, what, what, what do I do? I, I didn't know anything about precision medicine at the time. I just threw um, chemo at it and, and hormone therapy. And, and uh, so anyway, I, I know what imprecision medicine kind of feels like. Um, and uh, it was kind of at that point, it was maybe, I don't know, I want to say January of 2015 or so, where my cancer was coming back. And I'd already exhausted all the standard of care, pretty much. And uh, median survival stats from Duke Medicine around that time were showing that if you have metastatic prostate cancer and you've already progressed, you have metastatic prostate cancer of the bone and you've already progressed on chemo, you got about 21, median, median 21 months median survival. This is January of 2015. And um, again, my doctors at OHSU in Oregon thought that my cancer was growing faster than anybody that they've ever seen. So I probably shouldn't be here. Um, but uh, I got lucky, I got really lucky because um, feeling a little bit down at that time that I wasn't going to make it, I, uh, and maybe not even see my daughter get out of elementary school, I wanted my last days to kind of matter. 
And so I was working at Intel, and I knew that they had this healthcare group that was working with you know, the healthcare industry to help them use technology to transform. And uh, I tried to get in, you know, because they had this real dynamic, visionary leader. I don't know if Eric Dishman's here right now, but you know, now he's having a major impact at a national level on precision medicine, but he was blazing new trails for us at Intel. And you know, he used this thing called genomics to, to you know, crack the code for his cancer. And I was like, well, oh, that's interesting. So I got into that group and what I learned really kind of just blew my mind. Um, I learned all about how you can, if you get to the underlying un understanding of what fuels disease at the DNA, if you can get to that, that molecular abnormality that might be fueling your disease, it opens you up for a targeted treatment plan, potentially, at least something potentially less toxic. So uh, I did it. I went and had sequencing done. Part of, partially, honestly, a lot of it was motivated by the work that Intel does with the Broad Institute, because we partner with the Broad a lot, and I learned about all this cool stuff that we were doing together. And so I got sequenced, and, and that's when my path to precision medicine really kind of started. Uh, turns out I got lucky. I had clinically significant mutation as well. For me, it was a mutant PI3K pathway, and I also had P10 loss, so the hyperactivity. The way I kind of describe it is like my body put a brick on the accelerator and then drained the brake fluid and didn't tell me. So, you know, with this mutant PI3K and P10 loss, if I can figure out a way to inhibit that, I might be in pretty good shape because I didn't have any other major clinical significant mutations at the time. So here's where I think um, the partnership in research really starts to, to have an impact on patients because now I'm engaged. My engagement meter is like way up right now because patients get engaged when they get diagnosed and when they have a recurrence. So now I've got this molecular diagnosis. So I'm, I'm into this. And I have data, which is empowering me. So I find this trial in Cedar sinai and I call up uh, the principal investigator, and the conversation kind of goes like this. Hey, my name is Bryce Olson. I want into your trial. Oh, I'm so sorry. We, we've got so many people in, in LA that uh, are rolling into these advanced you know, pr pr uh, clinical trials, and we just don't have any spaces. Yeah, but I got genomic data. I got sequencing data. You have what? <laughs> I have genomic sequencing data. I can tell you that I'm a perfect molecular match to the drug you're trying to test. Wow, no one's ever called us with that before. <laughs> yeah. Do you, think, do you think you can come down and get evaluated? It's like, yeah, of course, I'll be down next week. And so I started this drug in March of 2015 and I shut it down for two years when nothing else worked. Um, and it was very non-toxic. It was allowed me to continue to have the, the lifestyle that I, that I have today. So um, that's my, my, my story. I wanna tell, talk real quickly about three things in the interest of kind of patient research partnership um, that I've found is just kind of lessons for me. So number one, um, share with them, them being other researchers. You have to, right? Because in this era of genomic medicine, when we hyper-segment people's cancer, you were talking about you know, EGFR mutant and ALK mutant and ROS. Okay, now you take lung cancer and now it's hyper-segmented all these different diseases. And when you start inhibiting it based on these different hyper-segmented therapies, everybody's cancer gives me kind of a rare cancer, right? So yes, I'm a prostate cancer patient, but now I'm a PI3K mutant prostate cancer patient who's been treated with PI3K inhibitors. I'm kind of on the edge of precision medicine here, because if my cancer starts growing, I'll probably have triggered a new, a new variant in the PI3K pathway, or maybe I have a, a, a new pathway that, I, I, that I've activated. I don't know, but I don't think there's very many people in the United States or maybe in the world that have been on PI3K inhibitors for two years that have prostate cancer. So we need to share data and make that available so we can advance the science and, and, and do those kind of things. The other thing is, besides share with them, share with us, right? Data made me empowered. It, it, it got me onto the path to precision medicine. And I understand that, you know, if the Broads is doing non-CLIA certified sequencing and they have data, you know, look, if you share it with me, I'll consent whatever it takes to say, I got it, I'm not gonna take treatment action on this. I will take that data, have a discussion with my healthcare provider, and we'll go off and get new CLIA certified sequencing, fine. 
But don't let CMS stand in the way because of some goofy interpretation that can't share this data because it's research. Bullshit. Like maybe we, you know, mobilize everybody. <laughs> maybe we mobilize everybody in the room here to kind of take some action from a policy perspective to get CMS to change that interpretation. And then lastly, um, uh, when you create projects, <clears throat> I gotta hope I don't get emotional on this. <clears throat> when, you create, when you create research projects that empower patients, it's really cool. It's super cool. Um, <clears throat> and <they're>, um, <clears throat> God, I speak all the time and I never get emotional. This is <sighs> um, the reason why it's super cool is because, you know, I, I, think, I think all of us patients, uh, especially people suffering from disease and, and advanced cancer, uh, we used to have, a, a, our lives were different before, and we used to do things that we kind of thought were cool, you know? And some of us maybe kind of thought we were kind of cool. And when, when you're sick and you can't do certain things that you used to do, uh, you can sometimes kind of see your life just be stuck, and then the rest of the world just kind of moves on. And um, when you open up a research project that gives us a voice, and allows us to be a participant in that and be part of a movement, it makes us feel really cool, you know? It, and it, it makes us feel proud to be part of something like that. And it motivates us to want to, to, want to do more as well. Uh, my last thing, um, you know, when, when I had this success, I felt like I had to, to give back and to, to help other people understand that there's a new way to fight cancer. And so, it's kind of crazy. I'm gonna just gonna bring it up because maybe other people can benefit from this and use this as a platform. But um, when I was going through all this shit, I was like kind of depressed. And and if you can channel your uh, feelings of anger and frustration into something artistic, it feels better. So I was writing a bunch of songs, and then I discovered genomics, and then I discovered how I could put this cancer at bay for a little bit, and I felt like I needed to tell a lot more people about it. So I came up with this idea of, you know, why don't we educate for a new way to fight cancer by using music to reach people that may otherwise not be paying attention. So we started this thing called Facts. It's fighting advanced cancer through songs. And it's really kind of just a platform. It's a platform to educate patients about a new way to fight cancer. Um, we're gonna ultimately bring them solutions and education. And for folks that have projects that wanna reach cancer patients that may not have tuned in to the other social media stuff you're doing, you could potentially use this platform because with very little effort, we got a thousand followers and they're just tuning in because the music's cool, I guess, you know? And, um, you know, part of the story on this is that we, we created an album that was written by cancer survivors, performed by cancer survivors, and sung by cancer survivors. And we got some fairly, you know, well-known people on it. Um, and we drove a ton of interest at South by Southwest for emerging artists that want to participate in the next one. So, you know, we think we're gonna to continue to build a platform that cancer patients want to pay attention to and, and get educated and, and, you know, have a little bit of entertainment at the same time. And so, um, I don't know what that really means. I haven't really figured out how to use it all the way and I've just been too busy with my day job, but I think it's another way, kind of an edgy way to, to reach people that may not be paying attention to maybe your research project otherwise. And I love edgy movements. I think what um, I think what Beth is doing with MetUp and things like that is just super cool. And and I think edgier the better. Um, so anyway, thank you. Thank you, Bryce. Our final speaker is Corey Painter, who's the associate director of operations and scientific outreach uh, here at the Broad. Hi, everybody. Um, I know almost everybody here, and it's just a pleasure to be able to, to be with you and share this time, share our stories, um, just hear this emerging theme that every single person in this room um, feels at the end of all these unbelievable talks, which is a sense of urgency, right? Urgency, I'm a trained biomedical scientist. I was diagnosed with um, cancer, and I'll talk about that, but before I do, I want to say that as part of my training, hearkening to what you said, Sonia, there was never a sense of urgency instilled in there. There was all of the things that you needed to do in order to get funding, in order to prove your hypothesis. 
which you generated so that you get more funding so that you can get a paper. And that was it. And I was a scientist because I loved the puzzles. I was a biomedical scientist, not because I was necessarily trying to save anybody's life, but I loved to think of the way that a rotomer on an amino acid might move in space. And that's it, right? That's all. And then a friend of mine was diagnosed with ALS, and I realized, oh man, I could, I could use this for the betterment of people. And I started writing a grant for that disease. Thought I could take these tools and I could help somebody. And it was only then, in my senior years as a graduate student, that I thought, wow, I could, I could use my scientific acumen to actually help another human. And through that grant writing process, I was up late, and so I woke up late, and this one morning, I woke up and I stretched in bed. And I'm telling you this detail because I think everybody probably has had a moment in their life when one defining thing happened that made time slow down to a complete standstill. And it's like you could go back into that moment and retrieve every detail of every place and everything that was happening, every sound. And it was at that moment that the back of my hand brushed over my breast and I felt a massive lump that was definitely not there a couple of weeks ago. And so I knew something was wrong. I immediately jumped to the computer and as everything in my family that has to do with crisis happens, this happened on a Friday night. And so I couldn't even I couldn't call anybody, I couldn't do anything. But by Monday morning, I'll tell you what, I had read every single thing that you could on breast lumps, breast size, the, the texture, everything that I could find. And I, I already diagnosed myself as not having breast cancer because it, it moved in the tissue. You know, So I had done all of my research and knew it was not that, but I didn't know what it was. And it took about four or five months of this unbelievable roller coaster ride that on one hill going up, it was that I was not okay at all. And on the downward slope, I was gonna be completely fine. So on the uphill, it was this thing called angiosarcoma, which is a cancer that starts in the lining of your blood vessels. It is incredibly rare, only 300 people a year get it. Most die in the first year. Uh, most present with metastatic disease because it does start in the lining of your blood vessels. So by the time you have a symptom, you're usually very close to death. I just met somebody a month ago who's wildly metastatic and found out by an incidental scan that he had it everywhere, all over his body. And so I couldn't quite believe that this was happening. And on, and, and then, but then the thing is, is they, they kept saying, but we're not quite sure, because there's not enough people that get this disease to really know what to look for under the slides. We have a sarcoma pathologist here in the audience, Jared, who can tell you that how difficult it is to diagnose these things. It looks like um, you know some normal vasculature sometimes. Um, and I ended up having a, a fine needle aspiration, 10 core needle biopsies, and it, they still could not diagnose it. They thought it was either angiosarcoma or a completely benign mimic. And through this roller coaster ride, I felt like I was just, standing on a shelf that was like maybe three by three on, a, on, on just this like sheer cliff and it couldn't move in any direction. And I think I understand what you mean. Like the day I got my diagnosis was the day I was like, okay, all right, now I can at least do something. It's not the worst thing to get the diagnosis. It's the worst thing not to know and not to have a plan. And so I got the diagnosis, and I ended up having um, a lumpectomy followed uh, two weeks later by a radical mastectomy. They have to take the muscle, everything, because they just don't know where the cancer ends. And there's no treatment plan. They looked at me, my doctor wrote in pencil and said, you know, if you wanna look your kids in the eye and say you tried something, you can pick one of these. And he gave me six different options. options. And said, there's no data to support that they will do anything. But again, here, which one do you want? And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, well, you tell me, which one do I want? And he said, I can't tell you that. And so I, I, I picked one randomly, and then I cried myself home. Oh, it was just devastating. And so I did enough chemo to go bald, and I did a lot of talking, and I looked for other people because there was nothing known. And I think it's a universal thing when you want to understand something that's gonna take you down, you want other people to walk with you. You wanna know what they've gone through. 
And so I looked for those people and I found them. Like I typed in angiosarcoma survivor and they were there, they were in Google. I reached out to them, they did not reply. And I would Google search their names and every single time I did that I would find their obituary. And when that happened, it was like, just like this black hole opening up right next to me, sucking in every single ray of hope. I was completely gutted every single time. Then I stumbled into Facebook. And I, I, I don't know why. I mean, I'm not, it was not like I was like the social media maven or anything, um, like I am now. But anyway, <laughs> I found that pictures of my, my children actually help with my research. But anyway, um, so I stumbled into this group with eight other people, and they were alive with this disease. And they had children my children's age. My kids were two and four. They could tell me how I could talk to my children about dying. They could tell me what types of side effects I could expect from one type of chemo versus another. They housed the world's knowledge of this disease. And although they were not gonna make me live a day longer than I was slotted to live, they saved my sanity and gave me my hope back in spades. That was eight people seven years ago. There's over 2,500 people in that group now. Most are gone. But there's a large majority of people who are caregivers, or at any one time, one or 200 people alive with this disease. That gets 300 people a year. So it's remarkable how interconnected you can become. And, and when you have a rare disease, you seem to kind of funnel down into one place. There's really only one shop in town when it only gets a couple hundred people a year. And so people find us, and then the loved ones that are part of the group help with the continuity, they help you know, carry on the legacy of the people that they watch die helplessly in order to use that information and that knowledge to help another person find the right doctor or talk about the, the, the treatment options available. Over the course of the past seven years, our group collectively has come together to make angiosarcoma doctors where there never was one before. And so there are now a few, a handful of doctors that, that have reduced their practices down to seeing only angiosarcoma patients. And it's made all of the difference in the world, down to the people who schedule these patients. They know when they have an angiosarcoma patient, they have to get them in there within two days. The nurses that dress the wounds know which way they need to wrap them differently as a result of referring patients to the same clinics. And we've developed this expertise in the clinic, and we've also at, you know, started a foundation and also put about a million dollars into research, which has been hugely rewarding and makes you want to put like pat your, your back a little bit. But at the same time, like Josh was saying, if you, if you put it in the wrong place or if you don't follow it through, it doesn't actually move the needle. It just makes you feel good. And so you know, I, I didn't expect to live that first year, but I did, right? And I ended up graduating, and I, I still didn't die, and so I thought, well, maybe I can do something scientifically. I went on to do a postdoc in cancer immunology because I knew the reality of the situation was that I could never get funding for studying angiosarcoma, so I'll study something sexy that has the potential to cross over, and so I picked cancer immunology and melanoma, and boy, did I hit the big time. Um, and so I got a great grant, and I was on my way. And everything was you know, going the way a, a young scientist would want. I got a, an awesome grant. One of my reviewers is in the audience. And uh, I, w I had a position at, at, um, at MD Anderson waiting for me. And I just took a step back. And I realized, again, this notion that scientists don't have that sense of urgency, that I couldn't make a true impact if I went and started a lab, and my career trajectory was to publish well enough to maybe do one study on angiosarcoma at some point if I lived long enough. And so I took a step back and I saw an opportunity here at the Broad Institute that came out of the brains of the people I think I love the most outside of my family who are here, that were looking for somebody who had experience as a patient, experience as an advocate, and postdoctoral experience as a cancer scientist. And I thought, like, who, what? <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> I, I'm that person, and I would love to come work with you. They needed somebody who was willing to, to give up that traditional career trajectory to help them think outside of the box in order to forge a path forward where we could partner directly with patients. And I'll tell you what, I said, count me in. <laughs> and it's the best decision I have ever made in my life. I came here to work very closely with the Brood leadership and Nick Wagle in particular to build the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. And I came here with the explicit idea 
in locks, in, with, the, with the folks at the Brood to go and just listen to patients, listen to them, and ask them, how should we build this? We want to work with you. We want to cut out the middlemen. We want to accelerate the progress that we can make directly with you. How do we do that? Who do we talk to? And there are a number of people in the audience here that I went to and I said, listen, I have no idea what I'm doing. It, I, I've had cancer in my breast, but I have no idea what it's like to have breast cancer. Will you help me? And they all said yes. And they taught me so much. And they just took me under their wing and they mentored me like nobody's business. And they still do to this day. I still go to them and I ask them, oh my God, what do I do now? And, they, and they are, there's no dearth of advice that they aren't willing to give us. And so we're so incredibly grateful for, for them. Um, we um, built this project, launched it in October of 2015, and have had over 3,600 women and men with metastatic breast cancer sign up, and they too said, count me in. And we're making a difference, and we're making a difference together. And the success of this project, and the, just how captivating it's been to the broad scientists, to the larger community, to everybody who hears about it, is unparalleled, I think. It's, it's truly remarkable. And based off of the success, the, the, the Broad decided, you know, maybe we need to do this in other cancer types. And they looked to me and said, what do you think, Corey? And I'm going <laughs> to, by a show of hands, does anybody think I chose anything other than angiosarcoma? <laughs> um, we, we, we went there next. And it's a natural fit, not just because it's my disease, but because we're better, and we're, we're better is the need than in an exceedingly rare cancer where you're never going to have enough patients at any one institution. You're never going to have enough tissue at any one institution. No way in hell is the NIH going to fund a project that hits 300 people a year. It's not going to happen. And so the need is, is, is great. The need has been unmet. And the patients are so unbelievably highly engaged so I went to my group and I said, hey, by a show of likes, would you join and donate medical records, tissue samples, and, and your information, your experiences with cancer if we were to build something like this out? And within an hour, 90 people living with this disease said, yes, count me in. And so we built it and we launched it 11 weeks ago and we've had 208 people sign up. We've already received back 101 saliva kits so that we can study the germline of these patients nine blood biopsy kits so that we can study um, whole exome sequencing, several tumor samples, and it's just going to continue to grow. The reason it's going to continue to grow is solely lying and resting in the power of the interconnected patients. Without that, it couldn't happen. It would never have happened in the metastatic breast cancer project. It won't happen in the prostate cancer project that's coming up unless the patients are involved. Because we do bring that sense of urgency that's completely missing in the academic or industry worlds. And so if we can harness that sense of urgency and what patients bring to the table on one side of the bench and bring that with the expertise and the desire to help from the research scientists and doctors on the other side and move together in lockstep, we can change everything about the way this is done. Give everybody a round of applause. It's really great. Thank you. So there are so many really interesting themes to pick up on. I don't actually know how much time we have because I don't have. <laughs> okay. So let me just start off with one question, and then uh, maybe we can take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so let's pick up on this sense of urgency that Corey is bringing up, that patients have, that that also Sonia and Eric. So one of the most interesting things I think that you talked about was how your sense of urgency led you to come up with a very different approach to studying prion disease that you said was really distinct from what other researchers were thinking about, taking a more preventative approach and developing, say, a research agenda or a sort of set of priorities that were very different from what was happening in the field. So what I'd like to posit is that that sense of urgency is it's much more than just a sense of urgency. It's a, it, that sense can create an incredible focus. And, an, and it's something that the scientific community needs, can learn from. 
Um, and so the overarching um, title of this entire two-day meeting is learning from patient experience. And a lot of times we think that's really about, well, collecting lots of clinical outcomes data and being able to collect their medical records and actually just collecting data on patients. It's not just collecting data. It's actually, what I'm hearing from all of your stories is it's actually resonating with your experiences, understanding that sense of urgency, that that sense of urgency can create new ideas that the research community can't possibly maybe even come up with because they're not faced with that same sense of urgency. So I guess the question is, is that the right way to think about this? And if so, how do we bridge? What do we do? What, what steps do we need to take so that the research community, obviously more patient engagement and research, et cetera, more patient partnered research, but what does it actually look like to make those connections happen more um, with the research, to change the way researchers are thinking in general? or anybody who wants to start. And uh, I don't know that I can answer all those questions, but I think um, absolutely urgency is something that I feel has, it drives us every day, it sets us apart um, in, in strange ways. The therapeutic hypothesis that I described earlier of like reducing this one protein preventatively, the, all of the facts that inform that had been sitting on the shelf for a long time before we came along. Um, but it, there was sort of a, a link missing where the basic science to get to that point had been really motivating and really inspiring to the prion disease scientific community. And that next step of sort of like reducing to practice um, had not been taken. And this is part of how we ended up feeling like we have to be at the bench, we have to be doing this. I think one thing about the sort of urgency in moving forward to pick up on something that, that Brad said is that once you have that, you have to move on to the next thing. And you sort of said, okay, so we, we solved the genetics, now like pitch it and do the, the thing that follows from that. And I think one of the most challenging things about our path is that we're constantly discarding the thing that we just learned how to do in order to do something that we have no idea how to do. <laughs> um, and I see why that's not how most people choose to do research. Um, and at the same time, I think that's exactly, in many cases, what we need to do. Mm -hmm. So it's tricky. I'd like to say, um, that, you know, we need to bake in the notion that it's okay to fail as a scientist. That's completely missing. You know, it's completely missing. Everybody's only rewarded for positive results. Only they take the thing that looks the best on a piece of paper and they put it out there and they publish it and that's it. But oh my God, what can we learn from not reproducing the same negative data over and over and over again? And just the, the entire incentive structure for only you know, having these positive results makes it so cutthroat. As a, as a graduate student, I was somewhat shielded. The funding was not so bad as a postdoc. Good Lord, if you were not working on something that was going to get you a nature cell or science paper, you were not worthy of even looking into the um, microscope that day. And so you, it, shifted, it, it shifted your priorities completely. The incentive structure shifted it completely away from anything like what we're talking about and solely with those blinders on toward the next paper, and that's it. I think there's two pieces that you mentioned. One person earlier, I'm not sure who which one mentioned that uh, as long as you think you're going to get cured, there's not that much of an urgency. But when you have your first recurrence or you get diagnosed metastatic and you find out no one knows how to cure you, that's when you become an engaged patient. We need to harness that. And one of the pieces that's missing in harnessing that energy into research is the translator, someone who can take the science and explain it to these patients and help them understand what they can do to make a difference. And I think if we want to grow this movement, we need to grow that capability. We need to train translators. Um, that's great. That was actually going to be my second question. But I also want to give uh, people the chance in the audience, if, if you'd like to line up, there are microphones at the front if you want to ask any questions. But actually, that was a great segue, because I was just going to ask you also that Many of you taught yourself the science. Many of, in many of these situations, you weren't scientists, um, and you certainly weren't uh, working in this field. Any of you really were working in this field. And so you taught yourselves the science, or you, you went to other friends. And I was going to ask, 
there are a lot of patients, I think, that want to know, they might not go as far as you, not every patient is gonna go to the depths that you guys did to, to learn your disease. But what would make it easier for patients? Patients really do want to learn when they do get that diagnosis more about, uh, more about the science. And what could we do, we, this, anybody, uh, what kind of resources would help um, your you know, fellow patients who really want to learn the basics? Um, I, I actually think most patients don't know what they don't know, honestly. I, I think with, uh, with cancer, uh, I'd say even today, eight out of 10 advanced cancer patients don't really understand that there's a way to get to the essence of what's fueling your disease, and it's, it's down here in the DNA. And, and we need to, I think, pool our efforts together and, and make that really brain-dead simple. For the, because I, I, I can just tell you, like, I'll go in and speak at uh, prostate cancer support groups, and, you know, these are guys who are, uh, the average age is like my dad. Right, and they're and I went into this prostate cancer support group, and and they're all kind of down. They were depressed because somebody was speaking to them about eating broccoli and cauliflower, and they knew that that wasn't really going to help them. And they're just like looking at their watch, waiting for the thing to get over. And and then I got up and I told them what I did, and I made it really simple to understand. And they're and then everybody like raised their head and they're like, I want that. And they're all they're grabbing the social workers and they're saying, I want this genomics thing. You know, you're going to order this for me tomorrow, right? You know, and once people understand, because this opens the door to a, a new way to treat disease, and it opens it opens doors that have been closed to most people. So, I think just a general public service announcement, awareness for a new way to fight cancer, would wake a lot of people up, and 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 then they're going to start demanding sequencing, and that's going to drive a lot more data for all of you. And by the way, like with announcements from. The FDA approving Keytruda, you know, for certain genetic alterations. All my cancer buddies are like, we're talking about Keytruda. And I can tell you that things like this, along with Lorat, how do you pronounce that? Lorat, Lorat? Which one? The, 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 the track mutation, the, the, um, Laratractinib, I think. So that, yeah, no, the, whatever, the, the one that got, so at, at ASCO last week, yeah. At, yeah, exactly. So at ASCO last week, it, it, you know, they, they showed that if you have track mutations, and 80% of patients with track mutations had a durable response over a year. So when that data starts getting into the consciousness of people's minds, they're going to go in and demand sequencing because they want to understand what m mutations they have and that it makes more data available for everybody. But I think it's also important to harness the media. We saw a huge backlash after immunotherapy first came out because all of the headlines trumpeted cure. And then we found out in lung cancer patients, because we hadn't found a good way to sequence them, it had about the same success rate as chemo. Except I had a lot of patients who had a diagnosed mutation for which we had a drug that worked in 60 to 80% of patients, yeah. and they were turning it down because immunotherapy will cure me. So when we, we have people who are learning about the science, we also have to have people who really can communicate how effective it is, what side effects it has, and how likely it is to really help you. You know, I'd, I'd like to just kind of underscore some of the things that Janet is very passionate about, and that's this notion of having science translators. Um, you know, she and I have spoken about this often. She was talking about this earlier, and she's alluded to it here as well, that you can, you can have very savvy patients that are participating that are really at the bleeding edge. And like Bryce is saying, you may have like a, a large undercurrent of patients that may not fully understand what is happening. Most people, as both have said, when they hit that wall of recurrence or advanced disease, either they themselves or somebody that loves them typically does some level of research for them to try to figure out something. And if there was some proxy to give them information that was digestible, that guided them along the right path. It may be clinical information, it may be genomics information, it may be how to avoid hyperbole in the space of medicine. Um, it would be great to brainstorm with, with everybody here on what are those things that, that patients at that point or their loved ones should know about, you know, regardless of the disease and regardless of, of where we are. So we have a question here. 
Oh, yeah, so I'm gonna ask a question. So I guess there's been a lot of talk about being able to go to the internet and find useful information about a particular disease. Just curious a little bit more as to whether people have found the internet to be accurate in this respect. Um, and did you actually trust uh, what you've read and now retrospect, was that actually correct? And does anyone have any good ideas about how to get then the correct information on the internet regarding these rare cancers? Um, I'll, I'll just say that from, from random Google searches, like there's a lot of, clearly there's a lot of garbage out there and we stumbled upon a lot of garbage in the beginning. But even beyond say like overhyped and potentially inaccurate and misleading media pieces, part of what we were reading online was scientific articles that themselves had a misleading veneer. And uh, it's yeah. <laughs> amazing the sort of therapeutic sheen that gets put on work that isn't therapeutic if you take a big step back and think about, does this concept have any realistic arc in like the real world of drug development? Have they, have they thought it through, right? It took us years to get to the point where we didn't get to the end of an article that said, this work is very promising for treatment for prion disease and deserves further study. Where, where we didn't read that sentence and say, oh, good, right? Like, now we read that sentence we, and we say, here's another one. Um, do you have anything to say about that? I completely this? agree. <laughs> so so I, I just add to that point, um, in I think probably like many of the panel have experienced, the, the information available was kind of all over the place, a lot of it inaccurate, garbage is, Sonia mentions, but partly that was a result of the fact that there was not consensus within the medical community as to how, in this case, chordoma needed to be treated. And so before one could develop uh, a kind of an accurate set of, of guidance or guidelines for patients to help steer them towards the right treatment, there was a need to even develop uh, a consensus among the medical community as to what is the appropriate path. Um, and I don't think that at the outset we would have, we realized how critical uh, that was going to be, um, both for helping to improve the lives of patients, but also uh, for helping to get patients to participate in research. So um, kind of one of the things that we've found ourselves focusing on in parallel with research and serving patients is actually improving the, the, the healthcare that's provided to patients, and as a part of that, helping to facilitate the development of guidelines for the disease. And once those guidelines were developed, then it became very easy to translate them into uh, kind of lay terminology that could be made accessible to the patient community. Um, and, and that's really, I think, over the last couple of years had a, a transformative effect in terms of getting patients to the right medical providers. I just, can I just say one quick thing? That's awesome. And I think that all rare cancers or diseases should, should do that, so that there's kind of one-stop resources available. But I will say one thing. Um, if you have an active online community, um, patients will bring all of the crap to you. And if you have somebody savvy in that group, they're going to be the ones to say, no, no, warm water does not cure your cancer. Really, move on. <laughs> and so... And when you've been online for a while, you start finding out from other patients which ones usually give the right answers and you start getting steered in places. I would absolutely love if clinicians would hand to their patients vetted online sources like the National Can Conference of Cancer Network, ASCO.net, uh, cancergrace.org is a bunch of uh, cancer doctors who provide information to patients. Uh, the NCI has a site, I mean, there's, there's all of the foundations usually provide good information. So there are places you can go. The trick is most, most patients trust their doctors to tell them, so have the doctors tell them where the good online information is. Another question? Yeah, I heard an incredible passion and commitment, and I thank all of you. But I heard a frustration throughout, which was the system isn't working, the CMS won't allow release of data, the grants can't be funded, and one of the questions I want to ask you, we as a medical community don't get listened to because we're considered to be in self-interest every time we bring up these frustrations. You can change it. And you need to figure out how to do that. We'll help you, we'll work with you, but 
can you think of how you would start to do that? Now, I was in San Francisco during the AIDS epidemic, and that changed everything. The advocacy of those patients who said, no, you're not telling me what I can't do, can do, was unbelievable in the transformation that it made. You could do that too here. That frustration is important. Can you channel that into working with legislators, FDA, and the rest for change? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I, um, is this working yet? No. no. So I, I uh, all I can say is I don't know how to change the world, but on a small, small thing, the platform that we just created has uh, allowed us to fight about a lot of things. So, for example, um, IRBs always do something this way. They always see a, a data set collected for a particular study. So you have to justify why you're collecting the, the samples or the data, what's the question you're asking, and who's going to look at it afterwards, and which consortium is going to be in the club that gets to look. And, and suddenly we say, oh, no, we want a resource that's there forever. We're not sure what we're going to use it for. And we want uh, self-reporting to be OK. Sure, we'll bring in medical records and other stuff if we can, but we want to collect data in new ways. And we want to use other platforms like wearable devices or other um, modalities, methodologies that we don't have today. And um, at each step, and ridiculous as it is, and I've been to conferences, like so many conferences where, I, believe it or not, people make a living out of talking for three days about informed consent, you would think by now, Maybe they'd figure out what the right answer is, and that'd be it. But no, we have to discuss everything again at every step along the way. But as we did that, it's a little bit of a different world now than it was 10 years ago. Now, people take us a little more seriously, and we have answers that IRBs, for example, rather than giving their standard answer. And this is because we also can come in on a pretty high moral level and say it's our data, and we're OK with it not being perfect, or we're OK with Maybe it's not the best research data set, but it might give us hints that can then be followed up on. And we have ways to say things that perhaps the research scientist can't say or the physician can't say. But it is a new day where we're able to push it in new directions. And there are organizations out there that maybe are abusing it, and I know all those examples, but there are a lot of good people just trying to do things differently. And I think, um, I mean, the thing that we're talking about in this meeting has been a real, besides hopefully, creating data sets that will be mined and will result in discoveries has been a really nice model for changing the whole game and saying we're going we're gonna to have, uh, like in our, in, in our case, we have, we don't even have, it's not that, I, I read the, one of the pieces of paper you gave us to read for this that said that one of the principles is that patients should be involved when this is all set up, you know, and I'm on the end of the spectrum where I'm like, patients should be in charge. And, and maybe, maybe we'll let the researchers look, you know? So, so, or if I have a 13-year-old prodigy in India that's supposed to be an amazing math wizard at spotting patterns, and he doesn't have a PhD, and even worse, he's not from Boston, you know? He's not brilliant. Um, maybe I want to let him look at our data set and do all the trendy things nowadays, machine learning and big data and deep learning or all the whatever buzzwords. So, so if I want to do that, I want to do that on our data set. And, and um, as we ask these things, once again, someone raises their hand and goes, oh, well, we can't do that because of this reason, that reason. But at least we're pushing it farther. And I'm predicting that um, what we're doing in kind of changing who has the power um, is going to start affecting other areas besides just the data. You know? So how do you take what you just said that you've done in one area and bring that information content to all of the other areas, diseases, and this incredible passionate group and the other people out there. Well, That's five, something five or six people do it, then we all point to them and we go, Keep going. look, they did it and it wasn't harmful. It wasn't harmful. Look, not that much harm was done. We worried about it and it never, ever happened. You know? We have, in our situation, we went, we put great effort into making it so people, patients or their families could sign up to um, participate in the platform and provide data and it had to be optional that you could, um, if you want, ask for a saliva kit and send a uh, sample in for sequencing. We didn't want to make it a mandatory thing. It might scare people off, and we can't spare anybody. Well, lo and behold, like I think as of this moment, 99.9% .9 of the people who participated all asked for the saliva kit. So all of that thinking and everything turned out to be 
big whoop, you know, not a big deal. So I think we're going to learn from these kinds of things. So I think that's a, a good place to close, unless anybody has a burning last <laughs> comment they want to make. I think we're about out of time. Power to the patients. <laughs> and we can continue the discussion at the reception. Thank you, everybody.